Pledging My Time. The song was also a single and saw some good chart success. I think it's a very good song, and Bob fits in well with the 8-bar Chicago blues. Everything from the title and sound gets inspiration from Dylan's heroes, Robert Johnson, Muddy Waters, and Johnny Ace. The latter having the song titled Pledging My Love. In 1974, Dylan said, The singers and musicians I grew up with transcended nostalgia. Buddy Holly and Johnny Ace are just as valid to me today as then. Towards the end of the song, the harmonica gets oversaturated, and I'm not sure what the true explanation is for this. In any event, this recording came from the second block of the Nashville Sessions. Visions of Johanna I did a separate deep dive on this song before, and unfortunately that video was lost. My old channel got deleted, so please subscribe if you haven't already to build this one up, but... Much of this song was written during a power outage while Dylan was staying at the Chelsea Hotel in New York on November 9th, 1965. Its working title even gives a clue to this. Freeze Out was the name. I surmise, and I think lots of others can agree, that Johanna in this song is Joan Baez. She even herself said it sounded very suspicious as though it had images of me in it. Many have compared it to a poem by John Keats, which wouldn't be the first time Dylan has been inspired by him. This is one of the surviving ideas that came from New York. He tried to record this quickly, as Dylan states, I write fast, the inspiration doesn't last. They tried their best in New York changing keys, changing tempos, and adding the harpsichord. They tried to flesh things out and even recorded for over 9 minutes on this song that ended up being only 7 minutes and 30 seconds. Along the way, minor lyric changes were made, She's delicate and seems like the mirror used to be like silk. She's like the mirror, and she's steady and seems like the mirror. The singer for Cockney Rebel Steve Harley said, I was hearing poetry. This isn't Woodworth's or Keats. Dylan is beyond them. If you listen closely to the bass at 116, you can hear it wanting to go back to a verse. Joe South quickly corrects himself, and you can barely hear it. It happens again at 627, but Al Cooper didn't even care or notice, backing up the bass playing and saying, It's very important what Joe South's bass is doing. He's playing this throbbing thing, which, rhythmically, is an amazing bass part, and it really makes the track. One of us must know, sooner or later. As said before, this was the only song recorded in New York to survive those sessions. This recording took three straight, three-hour sessions to do. I believe it was worth it. The climbing piano adds to the build-up to the chorus that pays off so well. The song seems like an apology of some sorts, a lot of I didn'ts and I couldn'ts. The organ player is Al Cooper, who again found himself on a recording that he wasn't even supposed to be on. He wasn't booked for this session and just showed up. Robbie plays another guitar and his bandmate Rick Danko does bass. I love the drums on this, played by Bobby Craig who played with Dylan before on Like a Rolling Stone and many other Dylan songs. He also played on The Sound of Silence. For the only song not recorded in Nashville, you can't tell much of a difference. This song belongs on this album perfectly. The song did not do well in the U.S., but it did reach number 33 in the U.K. I Want You This was the last song they recorded for the album. It opens up with Dylan's harmonica, doing awesome work with some bends toward the end of the phrase. It's upbeat. It's a song you can groove to a bit. This shows off Dylan's voice and his dragging of words. It's a pop song that shines when the chorus comes around. He's confident and clear. He wants you. In the lines, now you're dancing child with his Chinese suit. He spoke to me. I took his flute. Might refer to a friend and Rolling Stone member, Brian Jones, who among being able to play multiple instruments, played the flute. Dylan reinforces this with the line, because time was on his side, which matches up to a song, Time is on my side, the first Rolling Stones song, albeit a cover, to reach the top 10 in the US. I Want You is a hidden favorite among fans, with one quoted as saying, It's a shame that this song doesn't get the same attention as the rest of Bob's tracks, because I personally feel that it's one of the best that he has to offer. It's one of his tunes that leaned the least on political and topical points and simply allowed him to go his own way musically. 
and he really showed what he can do when he's operating purely from the heart. Stuck inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again. And again we go with the insane amount it takes and time and effort put into this track, as this took 20 takes and over 8 hours of time to be officially complete. Lyrically, there's a lot going on here. There's so many things to reference, novels, authors, and music, such as The Memphis Blues by composer W.C. Handy, the father of blues. And this makes sense. Memphis is in Tennessee, as well as Nashville, just over 200 miles away from each other. One of my favorite lines comes in the second verse, speaking to some French girl who says she knows me well. If your memory serves you right, he references a French girl in Bob Dylan's 115th Dream. The amazing Joe South is up to amazing stuff again, as he plays the main electric guitar this time. Al Cooper compliments him, saying, His unique guitar style is most discernible in the mix. He and I have some nice Oregon guitar trade-offs in that one. The original lyrics to the song was half on the typewriter and half handwritten, with a lot of final words being explored through the recordings, as Dylan first had, Oh Mama, You're Here in Mobile, Alabama, with the Memphis Blues again. Then he had, I'm Stuck Down in Mobile, before changing to, I'm Stuck Inside, during a take of the recording. The song is in the key of E, but he is cross-harping in the key of A. Leopard Skin, Pillbox Hat. As I mentioned, Dylan opens up playing the main guitar. They also tried to complete this one in New York, and I think this is Robbie's favorite that he played on. They tried it live in 1965, six total takes in New York, and then 14 total with the last one being used on the final cut in Nashville. Yet again, Dylan was attacked by the media who tried to make this song into something so much more than Dylan said it was. Jackie Kennedy's name was even attached to it. The overall sarcastic vibe they felt Dylan had about the good-looking and fashion-famous people of the world was used to describe the song as a very nasty song, as told by Nico, who claimed the song was written about Edie Sedwick. Dylan fights this saying, What is Leopard Skin Pillbox Hat about? It's just about that. I think that's something I might have taken out of the newspaper. Might have seen a picture of one in the department store window. There's really nothing more to it than that. I know it can get blown up into some kind of illusion, but in reality, it's no more than that. Just a leopard skin pillbox, that's all. Andy Warhol even chimes in saying, Dylan had just been there with Edie, in a reference to the castle in Hollywood Hills. The Hollywood Castle is a majestic mansion high atop the Hollywood Hills. With breathtaking views and complete solitude, this hidden treasure is a unique estate located minutes from the heart of Hollywood, which you can rent out for $500 a week. Yeah, that's a lot of money. That equates to 4600 in 2023. However, if you tried to book it for a week in today's market, it would easily go over 100 k Nevertheless, you can hear just how far the song came from its previous takes, as released on the Bootleg Series Volume 7. That vibe was very blues-like. You even get Dylan humming a bit. The song almost turned into something like Rainy Day Woman, as Dylan historian Sean Wilnetz says, It's turned into some sort of knock-knock joke, complete with a ringing doorbell, shots of who's there, and car honks. The group got it all figured out on the last day of recording session for the album. Robbie's superb guitar playing prompted Charlie McCoy to exclaim, The whole world will marry you on that one. Just like a woman. It's hard to believe that this is the first time we were talking about this song. I think this is a casual fan favorite and pretty popular overall. It had chart success in the U.S. peaking at 33 and ranks 232 in Rolling Stone's top 500 songs of all time. I want to adore the music part of this one before we get to the lyrics. This song seems like the first one with its own true identity. Seemingly, Dylan doesn't directly take any inspiration from any works musically from this one. The arpeggios are so beautiful, smooth, and classical. It's a sound from forever ago that yet still works. Using the power of the backing band, Dylan provides them with a driving vocal that sounds so Dylan-like that it's hard to ignore or even hate on. The lyrics and sounds are too powerful to hate the voice of any singer that does this song. The harmonica doesn't slice its way through. It fits right in. 
doesn't overstep, and lays a foundation for a tale that echoes throughout music history. It's about a woman. The ending harmonica solo is more pronounced, with many bends and vibrato. The ending breakdown shows how well glued this band really is together. The lyrics and idea for this was written over a few months. According to the records, Dylan started writing this on Thanksgiving night in 1965. Amazingly enough, without it being completed, Dylan played this the very next night. Trying to work through it, Dylan once again would mumble and sing gibberish until finding the right words when on the final take. Nothing new for Dylan, as we all tried to guess who was the woman in this song. Either truthfully or playfully, Dylan is quoted as saying, Even if I could tell you what it's about, I wouldn't. It's up to the listener to figure out what it means to him. Somebody might be talking about a woman, but they're not really talking about a woman at all. I always try to turn a song on its head. Otherwise, I figure I'm wasting the listener's time. That will end part two. Part three will examine side three and four of the album and a basic wrap-up conclusion for the album as a whole.